Hello, this is Scott Jens. Welcome to Sandbox Stories. A sandbox story perspective, EHR thoughts from an EHR guy. Electronic health records, or EHRs, have been in existence for decades. The largest EHR company in the world, Epic Systems, is located just a few miles from my home in Madison, Wisconsin. It's completely unrelated that I spent all 25 years of my optometry career focused on eye care documentation standards. From using a gray screen Mac computer to build my practice's first exam forms after graduating from ICO in 1991, to working with my mentor, Dr. Chuck Brownlow, to perform thousands of paper medical record audits, followed by helping create one of the most standardized paper exam forms that optometry had ever seen, I was all about excellence in documenting what eye doctors do. That led to the creation of a new software company in 2006 that I created with co-founder and technology expert, Jim Schneider, and fellow OD John Warren, which led to a product we launched in 2007 called Revolution EHR. Working with hundreds of teammates to build a transformative software for eye care businesses was a real honor. And I think it's made me enough of an expert on eye care EHRs to bring this perspective to the industry. It's important first to point out that I retired from software in 2018, and I'm so grateful for the people who still work on behalf of Revolution EHR customers as well as to the company that owns the software to keep it a bona fide leading product in the market. But with that, let's be blunt. It's time for eye care software companies to truly pay attention to their customers and take care of them. You've gotten your slug of business, your market share, but now you're ignoring the customer's needs and putting profitability ahead of truly caring for them. Before I take this further, let me take a deeper look back in time. Epic was started in the late 1970s by Judy Faulkner while she attended the University of Wisconsin. Over 40 years ago, the goal of digitizing records was to reduce storage, essentially transporting the paper data to digital formats. EHRs are now the center point for all patient interactions, holding every bit and byte of patient information. EHR growth in the 2000s was slow and methodical, First, big hospital and health systems implemented them. Then medium-sized clinic systems were adopting them. But when the American economy was rocked in the late summer of 2008, the future of EHR adoption was born. Regardless of whether John McCain or Barack Obama was elected president in 2008, the government was aiming to put billions of dollars in play in 2009 to jumpstart the remnants of the crash. While banking systems and lending institutions were being reevaluated and car manufacturers were changing before our eyes, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 brought forth a variety of key programs new home buyer tax credits, cash for clunker values for car trade ins, and also the $30 billion program called the High Tech Act. You see, dating back to the early 2000s, when President George W. Bush had a health information technology czar on his team, the government was aiming to somehow incentivize the healthcare system to go completely digital. The High Tech Act directed money directly to hospitals or even directly to doctors, as long as they implemented an EHR system. The dollars were going to be slid into their bank accounts on existing paths those which already existed between the healthcare business and CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. In many ways, this was ingenious. No new infrastructure would be needed for distribution of dollars, and all that was needed was a criteria that allowed the cash path to be opened. It wasn't going to be a system in which you bought an EHR system and then turned in a receipt. The government wanted this to transform patient care and improve outcomes. CMS had in earlier years moved the physician quality reporting system up from an initiative. PQRS arose from PQRI, and the only requirement of the doctor was to put PQRS codes on their visit claim, alongside their procedure and diagnosis codes, for a chance to get some bonus money. 
In that vein, the High Tech Act brought us the program called Meaningful Use. Of course, that phrase implied that the doctor would not just buy an EHR, but they would use the technology in a meaningful way as it relates to patient care and outcomes. The Meaningful Use program had three general stages. The first was to get adoption and to have all healthcare providers of all types capture, capture similar types of basic patient information. And then along the second and third, the providers would agree to share data with CMS about the quality of care they were delivering. Of course, this led doctors of optometry to see their EHRs implement unusual documentation fields like patient height and weight, or clinical decision support, or the need for connectivity to the patients through secure patient portals. As the 2010s marched along, optometrists complied because the reward from CMS of over $40,000 over a five-year period was worth the work. Soon though, the work wasn't quite feeling worth the reward. By the time that MIPS became a thing and macro was dictating how much your Medicare pay rate would be increased or decreased by how you documented patient care, the original incentive of the High Tech Act was a distant memory. Today, EHRs are supposed to be genies in a bottle. With every bit and bite of patient data at your fingertips, a doctor should be able to see the patient's situation at a glance, understand the patient's many matters, and know their many treatments from other providers. And care should be able to be delivered in a way that optimizes the patient's best health and reduces costs due to excess numbers of procedures, unnecessary added visits, and most importantly, avoids unnecessary illness or death due to mistakes. Yet, just in the last few days here in the summer of 2021, two fantastic publications have shown EHR shortcomings. In the Journal of the American Medical Association, a study showed a cross-sectional review of 3 million outpatient progress notes comparing the 2009 and 2018 documentation where there was a 60% increase in median medical note length and an 11% increase in median note redundancy. These findings were deemed significant and labeled as note bloat, as the authors went on to say, quote, a large portion of the note text was generated using templates and copy paste, with less than 20% of the note being original typing. That can't be better for patient care. The other article was a research investigation by the media company STAT, who delivers trusted journalism about health, medicine, and life sciences. Journalist Casey Ross found that Epic software users are using several artificial intelligence algorithms developed by Epic in exchange for money payments by Epic, despite those AI systems being walled off away from the users as the AI delivers inaccurate or irrelevant information to the hospitals about the care of seriously ill patients, particularly around the prediction of sepsis. In eye care, every doctor and staff member that is used in EHR and its associated practice management software knows that there's good, bad, and ugly. It was always said, no system's perfect, so I'm just going to get the one that suits my needs the best and deal with the imperfections as they arise. I heard it a thousand times. A particular challenge in eye care software is the reality that eye care businesses are clinical, but also hold a retail component. So the software needs to deal with a wide array of business activities. That means a product might be great for ordering eyeglass lenses, but not so great for documenting a glaucoma patient's visual field and OCT results. I have had the unique perspective of being in the inside of the machine. Our first five employees were tirelessly committed to making every one of our first 10 customers feel like we were working on their every need. We were immensely fortunate to bring along others into the company who worked alongside us, met our mindset, and never stopped working to try to improve a clinic's ability to serve their patient. In many ways, we succeeded often, and I'm proud of that. I'm immensely grateful to the thousands of ODs that believed in us, believed in me, believed in our commitment. It was a true effort, and to be there for you, I've never felt more honored to have been your partner. But damn, we missed the mark in so many instances too. I appreciate you putting up with them. I looked my colleagues in the eye and gave them my word that if they were a customer of ours, their success was our goal. And we tried and we succeeded, but the questions we got were never ending. Were our glaucoma data flow sheets good enough? Did our refractive test fields flow from auto refraction to final refraction to eyeglass prescriptions easily enough? 
Was our transition to ICD-10 smooth enough? Did our integration with external ordering systems have a reasonable user experience? Did our efforts to maintain system availability and uptime result in near never system outages? Had we enough advisors to properly predict the advancing software needs of our customers to expand our system to meet their needs? Was our pricing fair? And would a price increase that we felt from one of our suppliers be something we could fairly pass along to the customers? Every eye care software company has answered these and thousands more. And I truly believe that they're doing the right thing. But we're way past the 2000s when all the software needed to do was keep track of names and addresses for recall postcard stickers, tracking frame inventory, or connecting to refracting devices. Software is the nervous system of the business, and its data needs to be freely leveraged by the eye care business owner, doctor or otherwise, to help them optimize that business's business. Increasingly, I'm hearing from OD friends from all parts of the country using many different software systems that the companies just don't care about customer satisfaction anymore. They have their customers, and they're gonna do their thing without a lot of concern for requests to make improvements, especially if they aren't deemed financially rewarding. Unlike contact lens companies, they don't fear losing customers. I've been on the other side from these software companies in the last couple of years making requests for some of my consulting customers. I've asked them to allow their data APIs to be opened up to allow new and interesting software platforms to access EHR data to help the doctor do something that the EHR can't do itself. And I've been ignored or placated with an email that says, we're just too busy. That's not okay. Let me tell you something, EHR vendors. You aren't more busy than my company was nearly 15 years ago when our system was being built from scratch. You aren't busier than many of the competitors were when they were building brand new modules to add to their system 10 years ago. You can't be busier than you were when you moved your platforms onto entirely new ones. What you're doing is finding ways to reduce customer interaction and software development investments because it helps you find more profit. In the meantime, your software users are missing out on incredible new add-on tools that are facilitated by integration to their patient data. Yeah, the very patient data that you are storing for the ODs in your software, which is the ODs data, is not sufficiently accessible to the OD business owner. My fellow ODs, it's time for you to start to petition your EHR vendors to pay attention to your needs, to fairly open up their APIs and expand their software for an ever improving customer experience. Optometry software, when done right, could be the difference between optometry remaining in control of the experience of their patients or optometry being eliminated from the ongoing connection with their patients. Now's the time to put visionaries into the leadership of software companies and let them help build a better future for the industry. I plead with you to take the success of the doctor seriously. EHR vendors, we need you to do better. If anyone wants to engage me further about this, feel free to email me at scott at getinthesandbox.com. And until my next sandbox story, be great at all you do.